Well, good morning, Rev Church. One more time for Jesus. Give him a hand. Come on. Amen. Amen. Hey, let's go ahead. Can we just cheer Gavin on? He's doing such a good job up here. Amen. I don't know how long it's been, but Gavin, you are a strong dude, bro. Like, for real. A couple minutes in, I would have been done already. But I don't know if it's just all the peer pressure in the room of probably. He said somehow. I was up here on the front row, and I told him, I leaned to him, I said, he better be worshiping the Lord that God fight his battle for him right now. Because, because he's struggle up there, man. It's hard, isn't it? How are you feeling? Pain. Pain. Pain is the best way to describe it. Okay, so I knew that we'd be in this situation about this time. And so I thought the most appropriate thing to do right now is to get right into it. So I'm going to go ahead and start. We're in this series called Moses. Uh, let's just go ahead and start with, if you're a widower today, or a widow, this has nothing to do with the message. Sorry, Gavin. This is just an announcement I need to make. I got to move right along, though, because I don't want you to be holding that for too long. Your arms are tired, man. I don't want to put you in pain. So I'll move as fast as I can through it, so that way we don't waste any time, because if we waste time, that would just kill you, and I don't want to kill you. I love you. Love you. So the first announcement I have here today is that if you're a widow or a widower, please let us know. Would you do this right now? Pull out your phone. I'm being totally serious. Pull out your phone. Scan the QR code. We're going to ask for your name, your address, and a phone number. We have something that we'd love to get to you, and we just need to schedule up a time to get it to you. And we won't be able to do that if we don't have a name, an address, and a phone number. But we, we want to give you a gift. Uh, we love widows. We love the orphans. The Bible has commanded us in his word to take care of the widows and the orphans. And that's what we're desiring to do. And the only way we can do that is to know who you are. So scan this QR code and let us know who you are. Um, that's announcement number one. Gavin, keep going, man. You're doing so good. One more time. Let's cheer him on. Come on, Gavin. Let's go. Keep it up. So good. He's shaking up here. He's shaking. I see beads of sweat coming. All right, keep going. Um, we're going to get right into it. I've got one more announcement to make before we jump into the scripture today. We have a small group leader interest meeting. And the interest meeting coming up is this next Saturday at 10, 15 a.m. If you would like to lead a small group, we're preparing our small group semester coming in September. And so we're going to be doing 13-week semester this week. You don't have to run a 13-week course. Just within that 13 weeks, we're going to be offering small groups. And lots of people are going to be able to get to sign up over the next few weeks. But we need to know who the leaders are going to be for everything that we're doing. And so if you're interested in leading a group, attend either Saturday at 1015 or next Sunday. Just come early. Come to the early bird service. They're going to meet upstairs in the building behind us. And there'll be a leader interest meeting. Are we good, church? Y'all understand what we're saying? All good. Okay, well, Gavin, are you ready? I was wondering if you'd be ready at this time. So if, if you're ready, with your permission, I'd like to continue. Is that okay? I'm allowed to. Okay. We're in this series called Moses, and, uh, you know, I don't want him to strain too much. So I'm going to quickly debrief the story. Um, who is Moses? Who is Moses? If you don't know who Moses is, let's kind of do a quick overview. Over the last few weeks, I've been teaching through it. In week one of the series, we talked about how he was protected by God. If you remember, the time that Moses, the little baby boy, was born, the king of the land, the Pharaoh, said that all baby boys that are of Israelite descent are going to get thrown into the river to be murdered, to be annihilated, to be cut off. And Moses was one of those little baby boys that was going to be murdered. Well, God had a plan for Moses' life, and he protected him. Remember, his mom put him in a little basket, put him down by the river there. And of all the people to discover little baby Moses, we saw that Pharaoh's own daughter was like, oh, that's a sweet little baby boy. Heard the little boy crying and thought, I have compassion in my heart. She looked inside the basket, and she goes, this is one of those Hebrew baby boys. I know they're supposed to be murdered off, but there was compassion happening in her heart. She said, I can't let him be destroyed. And so she said, let's find somebody to take care of the baby. And God's miraculous way of doing things, by the way, God's in control. Can I get an amen? amen? God's in control. His miraculous way of taking care of this is not only is this little baby boy Moses protected, but they went and found Moses' own mother to take care of the baby. And, 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 and Pharaoh's daughter said, hey, find somebody to take care of this baby. I'm going to pay him to take care of the baby. So not only did she get to take care of her own child and keep her own child, but she got to get paid a little government assistance check to do what her, she was going to do anyways. That's how God works. How are we doing, Gavin? He's so good. All right, let's continue. He was called by God. In week two, he was called by God. You remember the burning bush spoke 
and it wasn't consumed, but God spoke out of the burning bush. And he gave Moses a call. He said, I want you to go to Pharaoh. I want you to command Pharaoh, the king of the land, to let my people go. Everybody say, let my people go. This was the call, go to Pharaoh, say, let my people go. He was commissioned by God to set the captives free. What was happening was in Egypt, Pharaoh, you know, he was keeping all of them in captivity and slavery, making them do the worst jobs in all the land. And it was torture for them. And they were praying to God. They were saying, God, help us. God, see us in our weakened state. See what this, these people are doing to us. They're tormenting us. They're torturing us here. Help us. Well, God's plan for help was this guy named Moses who was called to go set them free. Moses also pastored the largest congregation ever. Literally millions of people were in his ministry. He literally goes to to Pharaoh's house. He knocks on the door. And if you don't know the story, let me just quickly review it. Because Gavin, how are we doing? You need me to speed up? Probably. Okay. Okay. So y'all, I'm going to speed up. Y'all got to listen a little bit faster though. Okay. So we see that he knocks on Pharaoh's door. He says, let my people go. Ten times in a row, he will not let the people go. He won't do it. He's got a hardened heart. He says, no, I want these people to work for me. They're going to be my slaves. They're going to do what I want them to do. I don't know your God, and I don't care who he is. I'm not going to listen to him. These are my slaves. At the 10th plague, there was a plague that said the firstborn son out of all the Egyptian people is going to die. And that plague happened. And when it happened, Pharaoh realize he's going up and he's trying to be God in his own world, God in his own life and control everybody and do everything and really buck the system against God Almighty. And God says, hey, I'm a little bit stronger than you. Don't, don't you see it? Finally, Pharaoh breaks and says, okay, get out of here. Moses, get these people out of here. You've been saying you want them to leave and I want them to leave now too because I don't want the torment. I don't want the pain. I don't want the pressure. Get out of here. Moses then starts ushering the people out. I'm going as fast as I can, Gavin. These people aren't listening quick enough. Um, we gotta, if you just listen a little bit faster, I'd go a little quicker. So he says, come on out, come out. And so literally thousands upon thousands, you got grandmas and grandpas and sons and daughters and grandchildren and great-grandchildren ushering themselves out. And then all of a sudden, Pharaoh realizes, man, I don't like that these people aren't my slaves anymore. All the hard stuff's left up to us, and we don't want to deal with it. I hate this. So, so go get them. Isn't that the way that it is for you and I? See, in our lives, God wants to do something. God doesn't want us to stay victims of slave and sin and have a slavery mentality and, and do all this hard obstacle of life. That's not the call. God has something bigger, something greater. He didn't create you to be a slave to, to the enemy all day. That's not what he created you for. He has a bigger purpose, a bigger plan, a bigger calling. And he said, I'm coming to set you free. And he sets the captive free. And when the devil finally lets go, eventually, though, he kind of realized, hey, I don't like that I don't have them anymore. And he tries to send new obstacles and new problems and more pain and more issues into our lives to try to recapture us and reclaim us for himself. This is a spiritual war that's taking place between good and evil. And they're after you. They're after your kids. They're after your family, your spouse. They're after your future. But Jesus had a way. We notice that Moses is taking all the people out. And and all of a sudden they hear some commotion rustling in the background here. And it was the Egyptians coming after them. And they look behind them and they go, these guys are going to kill us. And they look at Pastor Moses and say, Moses, why would you even take us out of Egypt? Now we're down here. We're going to die. These guys are going to kill us. And Moses says, just keep walking. Come on, keep following. Come on, keep following me. Come on, keep going. Keep going. And as as he's saying this, unfortunately, as they're walking, all they can see in front of them is a large body of water. And the people start grumbling and complaining, we're going to die out here, Moses. What are you doing? It would have been better if we would have stayed as slaves in Egypt. God told Moses, keep walking forward. And he gets up to where the sea is. And the Bible says that he lifted his hands with the rod in his hand. And the water went. (laughs) 
and it stood with a wall of water on the left and a wall of water on the right. And the Bible says that as they moved forward, they began to walk. And as they followed Pastor Moses, they didn't walk on wet, damp, muddy ground and just barely get through. Nuh-uh. They walked through on dry ground, and the provision of the Lord God Almighty did a miracle in their midst. And as they followed the leadership of Pastor Moses, they walked through on dry ground. And then God told Moses, he said, hey, I want you to take your hands down and collapse the water. He takes his hands down. Don't take them down just yet, though. Um, He takes his hands down, and the waters collapsed, and the enemy was defeated. Not one of those Egyptians were seen ever again. They were completely defeated. What an incredible story of how God can take out the enemy. Can I get an amen, somebody? Enemy come after you, but they can't stand against the power of Almighty God. But the enemy meant for evil, God can turn for good. In Jesus' name, you will see victory. Come on, Gavin, keep it up. Come on, let's encourage him a little bit. Let's encourage him a little bit. Come on, keep it up, man. Keep it up. Keep it up. You're, hey, you're learning some new dance moves up here, bro. A little bit more. <laughs> he's shaking. He's shaking. Here's what I know. Um, we're almost to your part of the story, but not yet. <laughs> but not yet. See, because they get through the Red Sea, and they, they finally make it across, and their enemies have been defeated. You would think that now they're always going to follow God for the rest of their life, that they're never going to doubt. But we saw last week that they finally get through there, and after a couple days go by, a little bit of time goes by, we see that they start grumbling and complaining against Pastor Moses again. Moses, why did you lead us out here? We ain't got no food to eat. At least when we were slaves in Egypt, we had food to eat. Why are you leading us this way? Can I just submit to you that at this part of the story, Moses has done nothing different than what God has told him to do. He's just literally following the plan that God told him to do. However, sometimes when you're following the plan that God told you to do, other people are going to look into your world and go, well, see, they don't know what they're doing. See, they're not right. See, they don't know. All that stuff's going to grumble and complain. You'll hear that commotion along the way. And Moses is going, man, what's up with these people? Why are they so negative? Didn't they just see that God can part waters for them? Didn't they just see miracles happen? How are they now going to doubt who God is? And yet we do so often. We watch God do miracles in our midst, and then we doubt the power and and, and the anointing of God, who he is and what he can do. God don't need no help. He don't need any advice either. He's got it. There's lots of opinions floating around about a lot of things, but God knows what he's doing. Okay, I'll tell you right now, God knows what he's doing. You got to trust the sovereignty of who God is, that God knows the past, Hello, he knows the present. Hello, guess what? He knows the future too. And he has a plan. And sometimes when he's doing his plan, you can buck the system and think it's no good and it ain't right and you got all these complaints and problems about it. But I'm gonna tell you, when God's doing a thing, you better stay out of his way. You let God do what God wants to do. You step back, if you're confused about it, you pray on it. God will tell you what you need to know. How are we doing, Gavin? Terrible, all right. <laughs> We see there's grumbling and playing. Guess what happens? They're out there with no food. He prays to God. He says, God, what do we do? God says, I'm going to provide manna out of the sky. You're going to have food to eat every single day. You're never going to have to lack when you follow me. you got to trust me, though. You know what he was doing, though? He was trying to get the people of Israel to understand that just because you've left the physical location of Egypt, I need you to not just, just leave Egypt. I need the Egypt to be worked out of you. Because the Egypt in your life right now is causing you to think that slavery is a better plan than the plan I have for you. That what the devil has for you, what the enemy has for you is somehow good. And I'm telling you it's no good. I'm trying to get you to learn something. So he's working the Egypt out of them and he's trying to get them to understand that they have to trust him. That they have to trust him every step of the way. That if they'll just obey and follow his commands, that waters get to part and you get to be a part of miracles happening. But you can't see it and you can't experience it if you don't trust and obey. So he's teaching them that. But he's also along the way giving some credibility to Pastor Moses. Because every time Moses looks like a fool, every single time in this story. Why'd you lead us out here? You know what happened next, Gavin? Were you here last week? Were you here last Sunday? He don't think so. Where were you, bro? Now let's have a side conversation over here and waste some time. You were here. He was here. Oh, he said, I can't remember if I was here or not. I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, I'm good. Right? I'm good. They didn't have any water to drink. 
And you know what they did? They grumbled against Pastor Moses. Pastor Moses looks like a fool again. Yeah, God's just leading them. God says, what do I do? He says, strike the rock and water will come out and provide water for these people to drink. You know what he was doing? He was trying to teach the people not just to trust God, but to trust God's appointed leader. And he was giving credibility along the way to the anointing and the call that he gave to Moses. And those people had to learn that, hey, even though I don't understand, you know what they were probably doing? Hey, man, Dane, I don't know about all things what he's doing here as the leader, but I can tell you I was there whenever the water parted. And I didn't think it was going to work out. But God had a bigger plan. So let's just keep moving forward and follow him. You know what else they said? He said, hey, you know what, Brennan? I was there whenever there was no water and we were all dying of thirst. And then somehow, some way, Moses, I don't know how he did it. He just hit that rock. And then water flowed out. And I watched God provide. And so let's just keep following Moses. Because Moses is hearing from God. And I want to be where God is. You ready for this part of the story, Gavin? If, with your permission, I'd like to proceed to this part of the story. I'm allowed to proceed. Okay. Thank you so much. We're going to get our Bibles open. Exodus chapter 17. Exodus chapter 17. A little bit of scripture today. So these guys, they get through. Enemies been tormented them. Enemies been defeated. They didn't have any food. God provided food. They didn't have any water. God provided water. Now they're just going to rejoice and worship God Almighty, Most High, forever and ever and ever. Amen. Hopefully. Exodus 17, 8 says, the Amalekites, everybody say Amalekites. The Amalekites, who are these people? I don't know. They're just kind of random here, and they're just, we'll learn about them. The Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. What? Are you kidding me right now? Why in the world, if we're following God, and we're doing everything that God commanded us, do we now have to go under attack from these random people, the Amalekites? Moses, you don't know what you're doing. You're leading us into a war now. What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? The Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, which by the way, we'll do a study over Joshua in the, in the coming year here, but Joshua was like the apprentice of Moses. One day he's going to be leading the people. One day he's going to be pastoring the, the children of Israel. One day he's going to be doing it. And he says to Joshua, Moses said to Joshua, Choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. I'm so happy we're at this point in the story, Gavin. Let's keep moving. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered. And Moses, Aaron, and her went to the top of the hill. Can I get Dane and Danny? You guys come up here. Dane and Danny, come on up. Give these guys a hand real quick. Give these guys a hand. I just want you to stand at the top of the hill here with me. Don't do anything. Just stand. No, 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 don't do that. I guess you can wipe the sweat off his brow. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered. And Moses, Aaron, and her. So we got Aaron and her over here on the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. This passage of scripture will preach right here, church. There's a message in here somewhere, something about, I don't know, if we'll just lift our hands and worship and praise God Almighty and acknowledge him for who he is and honor him and respect him as the position. It just seems like when we're doing this, battles begin to get won. Victories begin to happen. This is how I fight my battles. You say, what's that mean? It means in worship. This is how I fight my battles. My worship is my warfare. When I worship, enemies have to flee. Enemies are defeated in Jesus' name. But guess what? When my hands start lowering, down, when I start getting focused on other things, when I get defeated in my life, guess what happens? The enemies come into attack. Let me just tell you, if you're following God, there'll always be another Amalekite enemy ready around the corner. If you're following God. You say, what happens if you're not? Well, you're just going to get destroyed. Well, I thought if I, if I don't follow God, I don't have to fight these battles. No, -uh, they're way worse. God leads new battles for you to fight because he wants to get glory through something. He's doing something in it. It's not a random thing. Oh, the devil's just attacking me. No, God's, God's doing that and allowing that and purposeful in that because he wants to do something and get a bigger glory through it. 
God's got a plan. Sometimes we can't see it. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. Whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, your hands tired, Gavin? (laughs) <laughs> when Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and they put it under him and he sat on it. Aaron and her held his hands up, one on one side and one on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. Y'all can help him out. Give him some support there in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hey, come on. In Jesus' name. He appreciates that. He appreciates that. Verse 13. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, he said, hey, write this on a scroll as something to be remembered and make sure, listen, make sure that Joshua hears about this because he was down there at the battle. He didn't see that we were holding up your hands the whole time. And he didn't see how God provided and won the battle as long as he was doing this. Write this down in a scroll as something to be remembered. Make sure that Joshua hears it because I will completely blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. Not only did God defeat the Amalekites, he said, I'm going to give you a big spanking. We're going to blot your name out. You're not even going to be in existence. Like we talk about them, but they ain't rolling around somewhere. You don't going to meet the Amalekites anywhere, right? There are no tribe there doing that because they're blotted out in the name under heaven. Moses built an altar and called it, the Lord is my banner. He said, Because hands were lifted up against the throne of the Lord, offered up to the throne of the Lord, the Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. This is God saying, I stand firm against the enemy from generation to generation. It's good scripture right here. Can we all give these guys a hand real quick for helping out? Bro, hey, good job, my man. I actually, I didn't do this in first service, and I feel bad. I'm going to set this down. I feel bad. I feel like you need a reward of some kind, so uh, I just want to hook you up with some Frosted Flakes from last week. All right. Hey, there you go. Yeah. All right. One more time for Gavin. Give him a hand. Give him a hand. What an incredible story of victory in Jesus' name. His friends supported him, and they got victory in the battle. But guess what? We ain't done. We ain't done. Go to Exodus, the next chapter here, chapter 18. I'm going to read you a few more verses. I want to teach you something this morning. It says, The next day Moses took his seat to serve as judge for the people. He, he took his seat to serve as judge for the people, and they stood around him from morning to From morning, they stood around him up through evening time. This guy was working his tail off, serving. When his father-in-law saw all that Moses was doing for the people, he said, what is this that you are doing for the people? What are you doing? Why do you alone sit as judge while all these people stand around you from morning till evening? Moses answered him, because the people come to me to seek God's will. Remember, They just left. They have no government. They have no systems. They don't understand anything. And they're kind of like sheep without a shepherd. And God's saying, wait, you're not scattered as sheep among a shepherd. I'm your president. I'm your leader. I'm your boss. I'm your God. You're my children. Follow my voice. And I've given you an appointed leader in Moses who you can follow and hear guidance and instruction from. Moses is answering all the people, though, from morning until night. He's judging all the issues that are going on, and it's tough. Verse 16 says, whenever they have a dispute, it's brought to me, and I decide between the parties and inform them of God's decrees and instructions. He says, I got to teach them what God says. I got to instruct them about the things that God says. And if I teach them and instruct them what God says and they do it, we're going to have blessing over us. We're going to have the hand of God on us, the favor of the Lord. So I have to do this. Moses' father-in-law replied, what you are doing is not good. Uh Uh-oh. Uh-oh. The father-in-law speaks up. He's like, hey, man, I'm watching all this go down. I'm seeing how you're doing this, and and I'm not so sure about everything that you got going on. Piece of this, yes, keep doing. But there's something else over here that you're doing that I, I don't think is good. What is it? Let's keep going. Verse 18. He said, you and these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out if you continue. The work is too heavy for you. You cannot handle it alone. Listen now to me, and I will give you some advice. And then I like this. As a good father, I'm like, hey, man, I got some advice. 
But then, may the Lord be with you in whatever you choose to do with this, right? And that's kind of how it is in our day. It's like, hey, father-in-law wants to sit me down and tell me something. I'm hearing you. I'm hearing you. And he might just go, you know, may the Lord be with you. In other words, you're either going to take what I'm saying, you're going to do something with it, or you're just going to kind of ignore it and not do anything with it. What are you going to do with it? Listen now to me. I will give you some advice, and may God be with you. You must be the people's representative before God and bring their disputes to him. That part of what you're doing is correct. Teach them his decrees and his instructions and show them the way they're to live and how they're to behave. They need guidance. They need instruction. They need wisdom. They need direction. And you are appointed and anointed by God to deliver that message. Continue doing that. But what you're not doing great is this part right here. You should select capable men from all the people, men who fear God. And let me just tell you right now, in our society today, we have a lack of men. We have a lack of men who actually have a healthy fear of God. I'm not talking about fearing God like that. I'm talking about a healthy respect for God Almighty, that if God's word says it, then I obey it. If God's word says it, I don't add to it. If God's word says it, I don't pick and choose and cherry pick which parts of the Bible I'm okay with and I agree with. If God says it, it's good enough for me and I have a healthy fear of the Lord to say, I want to obey his teachings. I want to obey his instruction and decrees. And when I do, I trust that God will take care of everything else. That's how it works, by the way. We just have a lack of good men that fear the Lord. There it is. But select capable men from all the people, men who fear God. We, you need to find some trustworthy men. In our generation today, we have, have a lack of men who are trustworthy. There's, there's a severe lack of men who are trustworthy. Instead of obeying what, what, what God has put in place or doing what God commands us to do, many times men think they have a bigger, better plan. And this is what we're going to do. And we're going to do it this way. And this is the way it's supposed to be done. This, that, and the other. And they've got their vision. And yet God's over here saying, I didn't ask for your help, your support, or any of your advice on it. I've got a vision. I've got a purpose. And I've got a plan. I wish I could find some men. Where are the men at that are trustworthy enough to go do what God has called us to go do? Who will stand firm on his word. By the way, all these men are out here. We just got to call the man up out of them. Come on. In Jesus' name, we call up that to life. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, we ask that to come to life. He says, select capable men from all the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men, and men who hate dishonest gain. What is dishonest gain? I think, you know, in the rankings, I see this happen all the time. You see this a lot in corporate America, but you also see it in, in ministries too, unfortunately, where, where people are all about climbing to the top and they got to cut somebody else down at the knees in order to get to the top. And they got to do this, that, and the other. We're going to make this person look bad in order to get the promotion. And I want to make sure I'm doing this, that, and, and, and I'm going to make everybody bad so I can look great. That's the spirit of pride, the spirit of control. We rebuke you in Jesus' name. Dishonest gain says, oh, I'm going to provide numbers. Oh, I'm going to provide stats on a stat line somewhere. But you can have all the stats on the stat line, but when you've got a, a, a circle of dead bodies all around you from the carnage that you've caused, that's what we call dishonest gain. He said, select capable men from all the people, men who fear God, a healthy respect for the Lord, trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain, and appoint them as officials over thousands, over hundreds, over fifties, and over tens. Have them serve as judges for the people at all times, but have them bring every difficult case to you, and the simple cases they can decide themselves. That will make your load lighter because they will share it with you. If you do this, and God so commands, you will be able to stand the strain. There's a strain attached. You will be able to stand the strain, and all these people will go home satisfied. Moses listened to his father-in-law and did everything he said. He chose capable men from all Israel and made them leaders of the people, officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. They served as judges for the people at all times. The difficult cases they brought to Moses, but the simple ones they decided themselves. What was God doing? 
God said, I gotta get you out of Egypt. Now I'm gonna work the Egypt out of you. I'm gonna teach you some decrees and commands and some instructions and some discipline. We're gonna get you out of that lifestyle where you're serving some false gods. You've got a lot of false gods over there in Egypt. I'm gonna teach you how to serve me, the real true God. You're gonna be set free. You're gonna see that I'm your provider, that I'm your hope, that I'm your strength. And he said, I've given you some leadership here in Moses and Aaron and Joshua, and these people are gonna invest into you and they're gonna teach you my command, why? Because I've appointed them and I've anointed them to go out before you and to teach you these things. And I've got my hand of favor on them and I'm gonna use them to help you make a difference in the world around you and become the people that God called you to be. What an incredible story we see through Moses. Say, how does this apply today? I'll tell you how it applies today. As our church continues to grow, and as their community continued to grow, there was a strain, there was a tension, there was pain that was being dealt. And every time Moses had his hands lifted high like this, he was winning battles. But when he lost the support of the people around him, his hands would start to fall and battles would be lost and the enemies would start getting some victory and gaining some ground. And so you gotta keep that up like this. How do we do it? How do we win the battles? How do we move forward? How does this apply to me? Let me show you. He said, we gotta scale this. It's not just gonna be Moses and Aaron. I gotta get some other people involved. People are gonna oversee thousands and hundreds and fifties and tens. Are you ready for it, church? Say yes. yes. See, we all skimmed past that announcement real fast, didn't we? Gavin skimmed past it real fast. He said, hurry. a strain. The weight of what needs to happen in this community to reach people for Jesus is big. There's an enemy that hates people and wants to destroy their marriages and their finances and their future and their children and their grandchildren. And what are we going to do about it, church? When are we gonna get burdened back for that person who doesn't know who Jesus is? When are we gonna be so burdened to help somebody see God through his word that we say, I gotta tell somebody about this message. I've gotta invest into somebody. I've gotta mentor somebody. I've gotta disciple somebody. I've gotta train somebody. Who can I take under my wing and show them Jesus? Maybe it's just simple, I'm gonna show them the love of Jesus by connecting and building relationship with them. You know how many people attend church and they go, I wonder how many people are gonna say, to me did anybody even notice me and yet they 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 neglect to think about the fact that they haven't said hi to one person in the room they haven't done anything to show themselves as friendly and and having that consumer mentality as a Christian is is it's all about you it's all about what you're gonna get out of it what are you gonna do for me God and yet God says It's not about what I can do. By the way, I can do anything. I can can make the man and fall from the sky right now if I want. I'm trying to get you to understand that you get to be a part of what we call a deliverance ministry for people. To deliver them from their past hurts, habits, hangups. And you're going to go set the captive free in Jesus' name. Not just physically relocate people, but spiritually relocate people and help them see Jesus in their lives. I believe that the Bible has the answer to all of life's problems, but we can't do it alone. We have to have capable people who will show up and learn, how do I take a small group and make it ministry? Because let me tell you something, some of you guys, man, pastor, I just, I don't have a lot of time. Time's my issue. I just got all these things that I'm involved in, the demands of life, and time is my issue. Can I tell you, you're already in a small group right now in your, in your week to week. You're already in small groups. The issue is you're not doing anything to make your small group spiritual. Because you have people that you do relationship with outside of church all the time. 
You go places with them. You work out with them. You see them at school. You play sports with them. You have extracurricular activities with them. And what we want to do is we don't want to change your routine and say, leave those people and come join the church. What we want you to do is take church to those people. We want to mobilize you and help you see how you, let me tell you what small groups is at Revolution Church, all right? I think what you think and what I think might be two different things. So let me break it down real quick. There's three different types of groups that we run at Revolution Church. The first one is what we call an on-ramp group. It's, the, it's like the first type of group that a person might want to join. And we say the on-ramp is a connection group. Connection groups are groups like this. There's a group that's meeting to go out to eat and do different taco places every single week. And they're gonna meet at a restaurant and they're gonna eat tacos because they gotta figure out if these tacos are any good and which one's the best. And what they're gonna do is they're gonna do life together and get to know one another. And here's what's gonna happen. They're gonna start asking, hey, what, do you, what, what areas of your life can I pray with you about? And they're gonna bring a spiritual component into a group that they're already gonna do. And you're already gonna eat anyways. You might as well go eat tacos with some people at the church. And you might, as well, you might as well have somebody in your life that you develop some relationship with that goes a little deeper than just high and by. And you might as well have some people in your life that are actually gonna pray for the things that are going on for you because they believe that God is a miracle working God and could do great things through your life if you just have some faith in him. You might as well jump into a group like that. We got a group doing volleyball this next semester. And they're going to hang out, they're going to do some volleyball and they're going to do some stuff like that. We got a group that, uh, that we're talking about making a group called the... I guess it's a Fall Guys group. I don't know if you know Fall Guys, the video game. What a goofy game. I love that game. Uh, they're going to get together, and they're going to play some Fall Guys, and then they're going to have a spiritual component. Here's what we want to do. Take the things you're already doing and let us show you how to mobilize it into ministry. You're already doing group. We just got to bring Jesus into the picture. We can show you how to do that. That's a connection group. The second group that we have that usually people go to a connection group, and then they find themselves journeying into the next step. And that's what we call a discipleship group. Because some of you, you have it on your heart to lead a group on how to pray or how to study the Bible. Or there's been this, this study that you've done that really changed your life. A lot of you guys did freedom. I know a lot of you guys are pumped up about freedom. And, and there's going to be a ton, probably more freedom groups this semester than I've ever seen. It was ridiculous the amount of people that want to run a freedom group. It's amazing what God's doing. But those are discipleship groups where we work through the scriptures. And we let the scriptures work through us and begin to transform us. That's discipleship. The third group that we do in small groups is called serve groups. Because some of you guys have a mission and a call in your life to go make a difference in the world around you, loving on people in your community, serving people in your community. Those are the three hubs of groups. So when I say start a group, I want you to understand what I'm saying. I'm not asking you to be a Bible theologian. I'm not asking you, you don't have to be qualified in a degree in ministry in order to lead a small group. You have to take what you're already doing and say, God, whatever you've taught me, I'm just going to pour it into somebody else. Whatever you've shown me. Again, you say, I've only been here three weeks. Take the story of Moses and teach the story of Moses to somebody. That's all. I'm telling you, that's discipleship. We've overcomplicated it. The devil's confused us on it. That's discipleship. How do you lift the hands up of your leader and your staff up here? You lift our hands and you support us by helping us minister to people in this community. There's one more step, a little thing called Grow Track. Grow Track, Grow Track, you say, what is Grow Track? It's our three-step process to let you know who we are as a church, learn about who you are and how God's gifted you, and then get you on a serve team. Why? Because there's people that came in today that when you came in, you had somebody smiling at the door, welcoming you in, opening that door. You had somebody checking in your kids and keeping them safe. You have people that are doing security here to making sure we stay safe on campus. You have people investing in your kids, working computers and cameras and lights and, and straightening up the chairs in between services and picking up trash and waving to you out in the parking lot and helping you find a parking space and ushering you to a seat, working in children's ministry and youth ministry and investing in people. But we can't do it alone. Can't do it alone. Now I'm very blessed super blessed to be the pastor of this church. We have 218 people that are actively serving on a team somewhere. That's incredible. You say, then you've got enough people. Stop. The church continues to grow and people continue to come and the strain gets heavier and heavier and heavier. And we need to call out who God has made you to be. We need you to join a team. 
and to be on mission. Because listen, I don't think God's going to stop with us saying, hey, we've reached a thousand people and we're done. I think God loves people so much that he gave his life on a cross for them. And his desire was that they all know who he is and that they all have a relationship with him. They don't just survive in life, they get to thrive in life because they have a God who loves them and goes before them and leads them and guides them and provides for them and fights for them. This is the God that we want people to know. And you can join this team and help us remove every roadblock in people's lives so they can see Jesus, learn his word, and be a part of making a difference in a community. Maybe you're here today and you say, you know, I don't even really know if I have a relationship with God. Here's what you need to know about that. God loved you so much, that's why he went to the cross. The Bible says he went to the cross to shed his blood for the payment of sin, all sin, your sin, my sin, everyone's sin. The cool thing about the God that I serve is that three days later, he rose again. He's not in a tomb somewhere. You can't go visit the tomb. No, no, no. He is risen, he's alive, he's moving, and he's active in a person's life. And he proved to us that he was God by rising three days later. He proved to us that he's a God that's worth following. And I wanna introduce you to him. All you have to do to know this God is to acknowledge that you want him in your life. That's simple, that's it. Know that he went to the cross for you. Know that everything that you've done in your past is forgiven, covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. And that when you ask for his salvation, he gives it to you and you get heaven. From that point forward, you don't have to worry. From that point forward, I wanna show you so much more, but right now I'd love to lead you in this prayer. If you feel led to pray it, just repeat after me. Say, God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus for me. Be my Lord, be my savior. Forgive me of my sin. Forgive me for doing life my way. Show me your way. Fill me with your spirit. Guide me by your word. Make me who you created me to be. Amen. Let's welcome people into the family of God, church. Come on, we celebrate. We celebrate. Grow track happens at the 1130 service today. If you didn't make it through it yet, I want you to make it there today. It's upstairs in the top of the gym building there. Pastor Danny's going to be leading grow track today. And uh, he's excited to connect with you guys and get to know you in a deeper way. If you just prayed that prayer and made a decision, would you text new me with no spaces to the number on the screen? New me with no spaces. We want to celebrate what God is doing in your life. Help me say goodbye to our online campus on the count of three. One, two, three.